Tonight I'd go back, like to go back to the book of Joshua. I only want to read one verse tonight, uh, the very first verse of Joshua chapter 13. And uh, we'll uh, go from there. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 13, verse 1, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. Now, this morning, as we were looking at the chapter that we were looking at, we remember one particular verse that we were talking about in the 11th chapter, and the very last verse of that chapter says this. It says, So Joshua took the whole land, according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel, according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. Now, you know, the reason I read both of those particular verses together is the fact that so often when people look in the Word of God, they look in it to try to find controversy. They look in it to try to find contradiction. They look in it to find something they can argue about. They're not looking for something to inspire or bring them closer to God or to have them to, uh, to learn more or to hide it in their heart. They're looking for it to try to find something wrong somewhere. Now, this isn't something wrong somewhere. Lots of times people come up with that, but that's not what it is. And when they do try to come up with that, it's, the problem is with them, it's not with the Word of God. And that always is the case. The Word of God is pure. The Word of God is true. And the Word of God teaches us about Him and about us and about the needs that we have and the manner in which God takes care of those needs and what He can do. Now, when we look at these two particular verses, there's a couple of things that I'd like to mention. One is that almost every commentary speaks about these in a certain kind of way. They speak about it in this way. They talk about it in saying that, well, the land was taken, but it's like any war where there is a finalization of the war that there's mopping up operations that has to take place. There are things that have to occur. There are people that, and we know that as we go through the book of Joshua, that there were uh, people that uh, hid out in caves. And there were those few people that survived somehow and ended up in the cities or the places or whatever it was in, in different places. But as we go through that, I think there is something that, is significant, and uh, and while no commentary said this, I, I as I was studying, there was a couple of things that uh, that came to my mind about it, and I and I just thought I would particularly mention them uh, just a little bit. Now, one of the things is that uh, you know when we looked at this this morning, and as uh, a little bit that we were talking about, uh, we always tend to think of. Uh, chapter 1 coming before chapter 2, and chapter 2 coming before chapter 3. And so since they come that way, then chapter 1 must be earlier in time, and chapter 2 must be later in time than chapter 1, and chapter 3 has to be later than chapter 2. And we kind of look at it in that, in that manner uh, oftentimes. And, and when we go in the Bible, that's not always the case. Now, it may be in this case, and I'm not saying that it's not, but I want to... Uh, mention a couple of things that seem significant to me as I go through the book of Joshua and as I've uh, been studying and reading and and uh, and following it uh, uh, following the verse and the patterns and the things that are taking place and all of this that that, uh, that speaks about these particular things in chapter 14 where we uh, where we uh, uh, are, are looking at uh, following this one uh, and chapter 15 and chapter 16, 17 and 18, we find in all of those chapters, we find dividing the land. We find the inheritance being given. We find the lots being drawn. We find 
each of the tribes of Israel being given their particular inheritance in the land of Israel. And as we go through there, I couldn't help but go back and think about that verse at the end of chapter, uh, chapter 11 that we talked about. That it says, Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. And we go over in chapter 18, and, uh, and it actually says something to the effect of saying, uh, you know, uh, in 18 verse 2 it said, And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Okay? So it seems to me like that as we look at this, we find a, a overall thing about what took place as they went in and fought, and as they won the victory, and as they divided the inheritance, and then it gave us a synopsis of each one of them as they gained their inheritance. So uh, to me, that kind of gives an, an indication here when we start looking at this, just a little bit about it. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to get complicated with this. I'm just looking at possibilities that sometimes we don't always look at. And the reality is that God gave them their inheritance. God, as we spoke about this morning and as we and as we recognized all the way through that it was God that won the victory. It was God that fought the battle for them. It was God that overcame the enemy. It was God that did everything for them in providing and giving them this inheritance and using them as an instrument of His judgment upon those nations that defied Him and that went against His laws and that, and that uh, committed abominations in His sight and continually rejected uh, the things that He would have them to be and to do. Even though they had heard those messages many years ago and their families and their fathers had neglected and thought and didn't think anything about them and didn't, and didn't trust in the Lord. And so when we look at these things, you know, I, I think it's important for us to see uh, some of those ideas there. But whatever you think about those particular verses and about how the inheritance was given and when it was given and all of those things, recognize that whatever it is, it's not a contradiction in the Word of God. Amen. And so that is an important thing for us to understand. We look at these words at the beginning of this chapter. Joshua was old and stricken in years. I don't really don't know how old Joshua was at this time. We know a little bit about, uh, about some of the things. We know how old Caleb was when Joshua and he went into the land to spy it out 45 years prior to this. We know because he tells us when he comes in and says to Joshua, you know what Moses promised us 45 years ago when I was only 40? That when we went in and, and, we, and I came back and I told Moses all that was in my heart, that we could do what God said we could do, that we could take the land without fear of the giants and everything else that was there. He said, everywhere your feet stood on, you walked on, you're going to inherit this land. And he said, and because of that, Moses said, I was going to be able to do this. I'm going to be able to go in. I'm going to be able to inherit. But those that, uh, that let the, the nation of Israel down, those that said, we can't beat them because they're all giants, those that did not believe because of unbelief were not able to enter, uh, they didn't get to go. But now I said, I want to do it. I said, I'm as strong, I'm as virile, I'm as able right now as I was then. And I want to take this mountain. And so Joshua told him, take the mountain, okay? And the Bible says that he defeated giants while he was talking about this, okay? When he went in here, he defeated the giants. He, he, he accomplished what it was. But uh, that's in the 14th chapter. If you're looking for that, it's in the 7th verse of the 14th chapter where it talks about that. And he said, God kept me alive all these 45 years since the Lord spake this word unto Moses. And since he said that. So, you know, so uh, they went in and done that. I don't know how old Joshua was at the time. He may have been younger. He may have been older. Uh, we know how old he was, I believe, when he died when we look at the end of the book. But we don't know exactly how old it was. We do know something about how long the war lasted. 
We know that from the information that we get from Caleb and the information we get from how long it had been, they had been in the wilderness and a number of things like that. The war to take the land that it was talking about in the 11th chapter in that last verse was seven years long. They, they fought for seven years. They took the land. They were able to overcome. They did it by the power of God. They did it as God told them they could do it. They overcame the enemy. They defeated all of those kings in the south and then they went up north and defeated all those kings in the north and everything took place the way God said it would and they were divided the inheritance among them with the two and a half tribes on the other side of Jordan uh, uh, claiming their inheritance but coming and fighting with them until they had defeated the enemy before going back home. So we see all of these things happening exactly as God said, exactly as he told Moses, exactly as Moses told Joshua, and they completed the work that was required. They completed what it was that was to be done in that direction. So we see those particular things. But, and of course, you know, really, when it comes down to it, in that sense, the word age is kind of a relative thing I got wrote down here, you know, and nearness to eternity, eternity uncertain. The truth is, you can be 10 years old and go to meet the Lord, or you can be 110 years old and go meet the Lord. We, we don't know. We don't have promises tomorrow. We don't know what the circumstances are. His, our days are written in His book, but we don't have access to His book. So we don't know. You know, uh, in one place, uh, I believe it might have been Job that said something to the effect, oh, that I might know uh, the days of my life or something to that effect. It might have been David. I don't remember which one said that. But even in whichever the situation was, uh, uh, when we look at Caleb, it's an amazing thing that it speaks about Caleb. You know, where he says, I'm as strong now as I was then. When we look at when Moses died on top of that mountain, the Bible says that he was as strong as eyes he could see. He was everything that he had been, and yet he was 120, I believe it was, or somewhere along in there. I don't, uh, I don't remember the absolute certain age of that. But the thing that he says here uh, that gives us pause, that makes us uh, consider and begin to think, is what God says to him in this verse. And so, whether we're talking about a timeline or whatever we're talking about, we're talking about what God told him about the nation and about the people and where they were standing right then at the moment that he said this to him. And wherever it was in the midst of the war or after the war or before the inheritance was given or whatever, he said, there, is, there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. And so, thinking about that, we recognize and know that there are always things that apply to us wherever we're reading the Word of God. There are things that touch us where we live, that make us think about our relationship. It's supposed to do that, and it does do that makes us consider our own situation. And so, are there in our lives and in our circumstances unoccupied territory? Are there things that we have not accomplished, that we have not done, that we haven't uh, finished the work now, you know, Moses was strong when he laid down and died, when he died on that mountain. But he didn't get to enter the land. He was strong. But he had work that was unfinished. He had things that he didn't get done. He had things he would have liked to have done because he would have liked to have went in the land and he asked God to let him go. And he said, no, don't ask me again. That's what he said to him. And in that, uh, he said, you know, you did this, and this is what's going to happen as a result of it. And he didn't get to enter in. He got to see, but he didn't get to enter in. 
at that particular time and place and all that was a part of that. But, you know, I don't know about you. When I was young, I don't remember what the age was. I told you all about it before that I went out and, uh, you know, we had Bibles in the house. We had, I don't remember not having a Bible in the house. But I wanted my own Bible. And so I went out and I picked up a hundred bottles, took them to the store and sold them for a penny a piece. And I don't remember there being six cents uh, tax on them at that day or time, but I went down to the Dollar General store on the left side of the street in Richmond, Kentucky, and went in and laid my dollar down, and I picked up a Bible and took it home with me. And I read from the very beginning of that Bible to the end of that Bible. Kept that Bible underneath my pillow every night until I wore that Bible completely out. <laughs> It was a dollar Bible. Okay. But reading it once, I know a lady who has read the Bible through at least 15 times. And she read it through at least twice while I was her pastor that I know about. You know, we, uh, we read the Bible and we study the Bible and we, and, and uh, the one thing that lady told me about reading through the Bible says, I've read it and I've read it and I've read it, but there's still places I don't understand. There's still things I don't know. There's still things I'm trying to grasp. I'm trying to get an understanding of. And the truth is, you can read it through once every year of your life if you live to be 100 years old, and there would be things that you learned the last time you read it that you didn't know before. You know, that you didn't think about before. I, I read through and I know I've read it because I know I read it when I was just a kid all the way through. But I know that uh, in reading it through this lifetime I read it and reading it through right now I read through I read through some things about David this this week, this past week as I was reading through some of the kings and and uh, and it uh, and there were things I didn't exactly remember that had taken place. You know, we're we, uh, studying, we, you know, well, what I'm trying to say is that there are times when we need to recognize that this word, uh, that there's still much territory to gain. There's still much that we need to learn. There's still much that we need to, uh, to uh, put into our heart and to become a part of us. There's much we need to hide in our heart that we not sin against God. There is much to be gained. And that probably includes every one of us, no matter how many times we've read it through. You know, there is a depth of love. You know, we talk about love a lot. And we use that word agape quite a bit. And we know what it means. It means a love that uh, is unconditional. A love that goes farther than. A love that isn't about what I love you because you love me. And we do love God because He loved us, first loved us. There's a scripture that attests to that. He loved us before we were even thought of. God loved us. But the love that, that God has is a love that reaches deeper than we can even grasp or understand. A love that goes to a depth that is beyond us. And the only way that we can love that way is to let God love through us. He loves through us. And then we can love and that's a territory that the only way we can get to is to allow God to love through us that way. And that is a gaining of territory that we as Christians ought to try to obtain. We ought to get. We desire uh, to love the way He does. You know, there, uh, 
uh, that song that says, give me your eyes uh, that I can see the way you see. Your, give me your hand so I can reach out the way that you reach out. And give me your heart so I can love the way you love. And that's a depth of love that we strive for and hope for and long for. Uh, and territory that still needs to be gained in our life. We we talk about prayer and we pray and we pray together when we're here in this place and we lift up our voices and talk to God here and we hopefully have a secret place that we pray. We have a, a place where we go that nobody else is around. Not our closest person is around. That we that we talk to God alone. That we spend time with Him. That we uh, that it's a private time between us and our Master, our Savior, our our Lord. That but prayer is hard work. Prayer is is you know I don't know how that when we kneel down to pray that we can keep other things from interfering. The sounds that are around us or our own thoughts and as we began to pray somehow invade and try to prevent us from being able to pray the prayers the way we want to. And sometimes as the Word of God says the only way we know to pray is to allow the Holy Spirit to pray within us and with groanings that cannot be uttered that somehow in the depth of our agony or our or our hope or our or our grasping that God uses that to reach out for the intercession that we need to make for others for those that we care about for those that we feel an agony for or their pain or the depth of what they're going through or whatever it might be. But prayer needs to be instrumental in our life. It needs to be so important to us that we spend time daily somewhere, somehow talking to our Father, talking to our God, our Lord, our Savior. It's territory that often we leave neglected. And in the neglect, other things come in to occupy and to tempt and to hurt and to harm and to keep us from being all that God wants us to be. But prayer does make a difference. Amen. And then, of course, territory that needs to be gained is Jesus looked out with his disciples standing by him and he says behold the fields they are already white to harvest and we recognize that in our occupying in our working and whatever it is that we're doing that we are so busy with whatever it is that we're doing that often we don't see the opportunity to touch another life for Jesus, to talk to them about a need that may be in their life, to, to reach out to them with longing in our hearts as we speak to them about them coming to know the Lord we know and the Savior that we know. There are opportunities that that I have right now that I never thought about a year ago as I as I talk to these these kids in the classroom and and I see uh, one that uh, that occupies his time with things that are uh, not only not godly but against God in some ways and and I concern myself with him and I pray for him and I think about him 
and I look at one of my other students that gives in a prayer request for one that he knows that needs Jesus as Savior. And, and we think about those, and we recognize that the harvest is great, and we recognize that there are those that have neglected to come to know. Even though they may have heard a message, they haven't, they haven't trusted. There is territory to be gained. There are souls that need Jesus. There are lost that are out there in our own families and in the places that we tend to go every day. And I'm thankful that once in a while I get a chance to not only talk about what it means to be a Christian here in this place, but where I work and, and, and where I talk to those about the Word of God sometimes, having that chance. We don't occupy as Israel was having trouble occupying and it may be for several reasons. It may be because of a lack of effort. Maybe we just don't try to do it. It may be because we're indifferent to the needs of others. We are so taken with our own needs that we don't think about the needs of others. It may be that we are just complacent about it. It's our own fault that where they are. It's their decision, not mine. And so we think about them in that way and we don't enter, we don't want to interfere perhaps with them. In this chapter that I'm looking at, maybe there's unbelief, lack of courage, power, whatever that keeps us from doing these things, but he talks about as we go down toward the end of this, he talks about, in verse 22, as he talks about them taking the land and inheritance and one thing or another, in 22 it says, Balaam also, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. Now you know who Balaam was. Balaam was that guy that sat up on top of the hill when Balaam asked him to, curse Israel and every word that came out of his mouth was blessing instead of cursing. But then Balaam told Balak after he couldn't curse Israel because God wouldn't let him how to get around that. He told them how to compromise. To get Israel to compromise. To get them to get in a party and, and sin get them to do things that were opposed to God's commands and God's laws to bring them to that place where they bring cursing upon themselves and his love for the things of the world kept leading him to do more and more with them until he died with them in the battlefield point that was made with all of that is to make us aware that in his compromise he lost. We lose when we compromise with the truth. We lose when we compromise with the gospel and hold back because we're afraid somebody will say something to us or make fun of us or, or put us down or jump back in our face when we talk to them. And sometimes it happens. You can say something about God to some people and they'll tell you to mind your own business. Amen. You say something, you knock on some doors and they'll slam them in your face. There are lots of things that can happen and sometimes it's a little bit scary. But we don't need to compromise, not with the Word of God. Not ever. Because what God said when he finished with this, 
with him. He said, I'll be with you. He said, I'll give you the victory. He said, you can win the battle because I'm on your side. God is on our side. And we can have the victory. And we can take the land studying the word. Finding time to pray. Doing those things that we've been talking about here tonight. The victory is ours because our victor, our Savior, has already won the victory, the battle. And now let's occupy until he comes. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you once again asking, Lord, that you would guide us, direct us, and help us expand our territory, even as you did that one that asked that in your word, that we may accomplish, that we may do, that we may be all you want us to be, in Jesus' name.